Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with hosts Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, and Carl Polacek. Produced by Kernan Consulting and for the international MSP community, we are dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. This podcast is sponsored by the Kerning Consulting's Millionaire Mastermind Roadshow. Get the answers you need to grow your business guaranteed. This MSP Business Owner Conference is two full days of powerful information, instruction, and action to show you how to thrive in this troubled economy. Join us for an action-packed event in Scottsdale, Arizona on September 28th and 29th and enjoy golf, casino, and the spa experience at the Lavish Talking Stick Resort. More information in the show notes. Well, welcome everybody to the SMB Community Podcast. Today we have myself, Amy Babinchak, and James Kernan. And uh, so what have you been up to, James? I have been busy, busy. It's, uh, you know, what's interesting, Amy, about the summer months is, you know, we're always busy with work, right? But uh, nobody wants to come visit you when it's cold in the Midwest. But when it's really nice in the Midwest, everybody wants to come visit. So on top of all your busy work stuff, you've got lots of social things going on and then lots of visitors, which I love. I'm not complaining, but uh, it just seems like my schedule is really, really busy. And I also coach football as if I'm not busy enough. And uh, that takes up some of my evenings and weekend time. So been busy, busy, a uh, combination of personal stuff and, and good work stuff. What, uh, what age group, what age group of football are you coaching? Actually, I'm coaching uh, high schoolers. So I guess I wow. keep uh, graduating. Uh, it's actually a, like a ninth through 12th grade team. So okay, we, uh, uh, it's been, been a lot of fun. Uh, some of the biggest mentors for me as I was growing up besides my father was, uh, uh, football coaches, you know, because I played sports my whole life, starting since third grade, and then played all the way through college. And uh, again, some of the the mentors I looked up to were were coaches, either baseball, football coaches. And so I want to give back as well. That's my my driving factor. That's very nice. So, That's very nice. Yeah. Ninth and ninth through twelfth on the same team, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's interesting, and and actually my probably my best player, the most talented player is a 10th grader, but he, he looks like he's a senior in college, honestly. Oh, geez. (laughs) Big guy. Yeah. He is a big guy, super fast. Um, So uh, anyway, you can't judge a book by its cover, I guess, age wise, but uh, I'm lucky to, lucky to have him on the team. Nice. Why so not? What have you it's been something up to? you enjoy. Well, you know, I've been trying to use my boat as much as possible because, like yeah. you said, it's summer in the Midwest and, um, you know, there's only so many days. So I try to use all the weekends and then get away for a couple of weeks uh, in the summer months as well. Um, so this weekend we were up there and we did something fun. We took our dinghy with another. 18 other dinghies and we went all the way up the Sheboygan River into Mullet Lake, which is the, it might be the largest inland lake in Michigan. It's a big lake. Um, It was fun. There was a pontoon boat there with a live band on it. And, you know, they were playing all kinds of music and it was on a stick of sandbar. And so we anchored out and got to know people that I I hadn't met before. So, so that was fun. And um, I always like traveling up, up the river. It's, I don't know. Sheboygan is a uh, has a working river, so when you start off, it's like the Coast Guard and some marine engineering companies and research vessels, and, and eventually that gives way to housing and stuff. And it's just kind of a fun, interesting river to to traverse hmm. up, and you get to go up a lock, thirteen and a half feet too. So that's fun. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Yep, we all crammed into the lock together, all 19 dinghies. So. <laughs> we got made sure we got a picture of that. We have an MSP question of the week. And um, the question is, should employees come into the office, work remote, do hybrid? Is there a best model? What do you think? 
Yeah, that uh, gosh, that's so that's so interesting. You know, we uh, I think we learned a lot through COVID, right? And uh, if you ask me that question before COVID, I was more of a a culture builder where you for sure had to have your people in the office. As you know, if you weren't at meetings, you need to be in the office, right? I mean, that was pretty much my mindset. And then uh, you know, we we we've got the tools in place to monitor productivity and so forth. I mean, ultimately, long story short, I, I think my answer would be a hybrid where you have a combination of both. You give your employees a little bit of freedom, you know, to do what they need to do. Uh, but I think it's harder to build your culture, uh, train people when everybody's working remote and it's kind of spotty. Uh, but I'm not a fan anymore of having everybody report in the office. You got to be there first thing, you know, you got to be the last one to leave. It's, I think that's old school and that doesn't really work. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I've ran running my MSP for 23 years, a hundred percent remote. So, mm -hmm. you know, I am definitely an outlier, but what you said about culture is absolutely true. You have to make an effort at it if you're going to have people at home, whether they're at home all the time or hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, you have to make an effort at culture. And I think a lot of people took culture for granted, right? When they oh, had people yeah. in the office, they could just sort of assume the culture was happening without having to think about it. But now they have to, that was probably a wrong assumption because they've seen a lot of businesses with very poor culture because it wasn't mm. planned or thought or cultivated. Um, and so when you have a remote, remote business, you have to think about that. Um, and the, the, way that, the way that I tackled that was uh, Tuesdays. <laughs> so um, Tuesday morning on one week and Tuesday evening on the next week, so we alternated, right? So Tuesday was a Tuesday morning it was a online meeting and yeah. um, we would all get together and this was a time for them to ask questions. We talked about clients. We used to physically get together before, before COVID. Now we do it online. Um, so back in the day, physically together on Tuesday mornings, just for a meeting, everybody would come together and we would talk about clients and call mm -hmm. out different client names. What's going on with this client? Give us an update, give us an update, right? Do you have any questions? Do you have any things to bounce off? Um, yeah. And I would go so far down as to call out individual names of employees that worked at clients and say, tell me about this person. Because yeah. when they're not in the office, they're supposed to be deeply engaged with customers, right? So right. I wanted them to actually know the people. And then on the alternate Tuesdays, what we did was group training. And we did it in the evening, so 4 to 7 p.m., and it was written into their employment contract that they would be available every other Tuesday, 4 to 7 p.m., um, and they would get together physically in person and do group training together. Hmm. Right. And so those two things are really what kept the culture of the, of the business and also um, ingrained in them the process of continuous training. Yeah, I I love Amy the idea of the Tuesday evening trainings, and that you got physically together and did that because it's uh, you know training in itself is hard enough, and if you're doing it by yourself remotely, it's even more difficult and it's even more non-exciting, right? <laughs> it's the most yeah, it's a thing. yeah, it's a lot slower as a group. You know, we would yeah. pick out pick out some webinar or course that we wanted to do. And, you know, if it was an hour or an hour and a half long, it would take us three hours to get through it. Because mm -hmm. what happens is the, the culture that developed was that they had no problem asking questions. So mm -hmm. we, would, we were constantly stopping the video, stopping the course, you know, taking the, make sure everybody was on the right page, everybody understood, you know, letting, giving them opportunity to ask, ask their question. Um, and so I know in a lot of places, people are afraid to ask questions, but we really developed the culture of uh, yeah. you should be asking questions. Like, yeah. like if you're not asking a question, the culture was that there must be something wrong with you. And we would add like, why aren't you asking any questions? Like, you know, mm -hmm. something, yeah. something's yeah. wrong here. I agree. I agree. It's uh, it's important. And then 
was it all like on demand training or did you have live training where you had an instructor or or was it both um it was almost all on demand training the only live okay. instructor there would be would uh would be me on occasion you know i might okay. i might lead something um yeah so pretty much pretty much all on demand i mean our industry is really so fortunate that we have training available to us, incredible training available to us at free or, or very low cost. Yeah. Yep. So yep. We're, we're really lucky at that. And, you know, I mentioned the dinghy ride thing. I got to meet some people I hadn't met before and um, their topic of conversation a lot was hybrid work mm. and how valuable it was to them so that they could um, you know, even if they were working at the boat, at least they were up there and that, you know, they, when work was done, now it was instant play time instead of, oh, let's get in the car and now drive three hours. Yeah. And so it gave them the flexibility to actually come up with more fun time, which was great. Um, and they talked to two about how, um, but one of them, you know, their daughter had moved out of New York City. She really loved working in New York City, loved New York City. And then when COVID happened, decided to move, moved into a small town in another state nearby. Um, but when work called her back, she was like, no, you know, I really, I really like where I'm living now. I think I'm going to stay here. And so, yeah. I, you know, I think a lot of people have made that decision that the extra flexibility and the ability to live in places that weren't an option before right. is valuable right. to them. You know, yeah. and it's been a problem for our small towns, right? They didn't have jobs for people. So mm -hmm. people have to leave the small town if they want to, you know, if they want to earn more money. Yeah. Not, um, and not I, anymore. I, yeah, maybe this is going to turn around. I, I think it will. I think, I think this is going to be a, a question still for another decade. I mean, if COVID yeah. taught us anything, it's that middle managers were really bad at their jobs. They didn't know <laughs> how to manage people if they couldn't see them. And, uh, you know, that's going to take time to work itself out. But I think it can really be a boon for small towns, and that would be good for our country. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a great point. And I, I love the idea of the hybrid workforce, but you've got to be very deliberate uh, do certain things like maybe morning huddles for every 10, 15 minutes every day, just to check in, make it interactive, get everybody talking, get them inspired for the day. What did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What are your goals or top three things? Uh, and then I've even seen some environments, I don't know if I would enjoy this, but use Zoom where you're like on Zoom all day long, interacting almost as if you're in a help desk with um other team members, but everybody's, you know, live on Zoom so they could interact and ask questions and, and help one another. So, uh, but they're all remote. Yeah, so. I've heard, I've heard that too. I, I think I would find that disruptive myself, but, you know, mm -hmm. it just depends on, again, that culture that you want to build for your, for your business. Right, right. Uh, you know, the other thing I will say that spontaneously happens during COVID um, is that uh, my staff started logging into Teams in the morning. 8.30 is when they start. And at 8.30, every day now, they put good morning into Teams, right? And sometimes that's just it, good morning, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes a cartoon, sometimes some banter about the latest movie they saw over the weekend happens. But that kind of thing happens in an office when people walk in the door, right? And so I, it was really interesting for me that it was COVID that added that to my corporate culture. And it was led by the employees that felt the need for that extra little bit of connection. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, I, I may have told this story before, but one of my favorite COVID stories was this was like on the tail end of COVID. And this was in a very uh, restrictive city where, you know, Everybody had to work remote. They were very isolated. They didn't want you coming in the office, but it was on the back end. So people were slowly starting, slowly coming back in the office, but it had been a while. You know, unlike in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, it was shut down for like two weeks. And then it was like everybody just kind of started getting back together and 
you'd go in restaurants and it was almost almost normal right but most people were wearing masks uh but people it, it there wasn't much of a lapse at all but anyway a client was calling me and uh I remember it was later in the day for me because they were a couple hours behind me. And so <clears throat> it was in the early evening for them, but they were messaging me and he was really upset about his employees didn't want to come in the office, his technicians. And uh, he was so upset. He was getting ready to fire his entire help desk. And I said, hold, hold on a second. I go, really, what's bothering you? And he goes, well, I, I, I think they're screwing off. I think they're goofing off taking advantage of this. And I can't see what they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. And I'm going to fire the whole effing bunch of them. And I'm like, all right, calm down, calm down, take a deep breath. And we, we were texting each other back and forth, all of this. And then when I could see how upset he was, I jumped on the phone, called him and said, hey, run a profit and loss statement right now. I want you to pull it up and let's take a look and let's just do the last, uh, I want to see the last 24 months. And then you tell me when your team started working remote and we're going to do a before and after. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, Oh, Oh, okay. And so I just, I want to see it in black and white. I want to see the numbers. And I remember when he pulled the numbers up, all of a sudden he just was, he just super quiet. And I said, okay, well, what did, you know, cause I'm on the phone. I didn't see it. And I said, well, what are you looking at? And he said, well, you know, it looks like our productivity has gone up about 25%. You know, meaning I'm making a lot more money. And yeah. uh, so their <laughs> their utilization has gone up. Their billable utilization has gone up when they're working remote. And his profitability, his net income went up. Mm -hmm. And I think his net income was up like over 70%. And the productivity was up in the 20s or something, if I remember right. But it wow. was pretty interesting, Amy, when we were kind of looked at the numbers. And and I, I've seen the opposite of that, where people take advantage of it and they goof off. But Kind of back to your point, you know, we need to learn how to be better leaders and managers, leverage the tools, keep people engaged and keep them inspired. Uh, but uh, long story short, I love the hybrid workforce. Yeah, well, I mean, that business owner learned several valuable lessons in that. I right. mean, the, probably the most important is he, he needs to pay attention to the numbers in his business. <laughs> right, right. You can't right. make you can't make intelligent decisions if you don't you don't know what's yeah. going on, right? I mean, yeah, yeah well, so, I mean, just just think of the damage he could have done if just acting emotionally that way. Yeah, because he he was certainly very emotionally fired up and he was charged and he was ready to go. But yeah, that's a great point. It's it's interesting to me because I was a finance major in college. I loved I love numbers. You know, to me, it's that's the score. You know, I'm super competitive. I played sports my whole life. That's why they have a scoreboard, right? Because winning is important. Uh, and, you know, that's why they keep score. So to me in business, same way, I want to keep score and make sure that we're winning every day and help my customers do the same thing. Um, when I speak at different conferences of a question, I frequently ask, I say, how many business owners in the room have had an accounting or a bookkeeping or a finance class? You know, how many? And normally it's only about 10 to 20%. So not very many, but to your point, Amy, it's uh, shocking to me how many business owners have a hard time reading a financial statement where they don't really know how they're how they're doing. So uh, it's important to either get someone on your team that does or create a simple dashboard that will report out the basic things that you need to know on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. Um, those numbers are critical. Yeah, we you know most most businesses use QuickBooks and those reports are built in, right? It's just yeah. a matter of a couple of clicks and you can have them, but you're right. You do need to know what it is they're telling you. Yeah. And you need to understand the cash flow in your business a little bit because some months may look bad, but they're not bad. I had that freak out moment recently myself because, um, you know, we we collected a lot of money one month for a, the annual renewals for Microsoft licensing, and then we paid it out the next month. So, that, 
So that that second month looked horrible. <laughs> right. But you know, it's just a the way the way the cash flows through the business was not yeah. not actually a down month. Yeah, so, true. Good point. Yeah. Good point. It's time for five minutes with somebody smart. So five minutes with a smart person. I caught up with Catherine Rose from ChannelWise, and here's what she had to say. Hi, this is Carl, and I'm speaking right now with Catherine Rose from ChannelWise. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Carl. So let me take a big, big uh, uh, step back and say, what the heck is ChannelWise? And, and we'll give people the big introduction to that. So first of all, what is ChannelWise? And then we'll talk about you. Sure, great. So ChannelWise is a platform that we provide access one-on-one -on -one through video consultations, um, access to experts and subject matter experts and coaches and consultants, if you will, um, with for folks in the channel to get answers to their practical, you know, questions that they're, oh my God, can I say it again? Yep. I just came off four hours of the coaching cafe. I thought I was going to be good. Okay. <laughs> channel wise is a platform that provides channel partners and vendors access to subject matter experts for one-on-one -on -one video consultations so they can get practical tactical advice for their critical business questions. Very cool. All right, so now we know what that is, and I have been involved because you invited the National Society of IT Service Providers, where you are a vendor, uh, to <laughs> participate in some coffee coaching, and we had three coaches there uh, at Channel Partners, and so that was a great experience, and that was my first actual like hands-on being involved experience. Um, so. How did who who are you and how did you come up with this versus anybody else on earth? Well, so th it really kind of goes back all the way back to like 2007. Um, you know, I was working on Wall Street at the time, and uh, the mortgage market melted down. They shut our division. I uh, was eight and a half months pregnant with my first child, and my mom had a brain aneurysm that left her paraplegic within oh three God. months time. Exactly. Right. Within three months time, you know, I used to say it was like a bad country song. All I needed was like for my dog to run away, my truck to break down, you know, <laughs> and I'd have a top 10 hit. And that's what it was like. And at the time I knew I had to reinvent myself, but you know, I, I had a brand new baby. I had to, you know, help take care of my mom. And so I really couldn't jump into a full-time job and you know, the financial markets were crazy. And so I went back to all my old brokers because that's the salespeople, right? That's what we do. We go to our old clients. Hey, what can I do? I can help you. And they all said they wanted their websites to rank on the first page of Google. Now that was like, you know, it was two, yeah, 2006, 2007. And people, you know, I didn't even know it was called search engine optimization. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. But I told my top client, I was like, yeah, I'll get back to you in two weeks, <laughs> you know, cause as we do in sales. Right. right. And so I, uh, so but I, but I didn't know anything about it, like I said. And so it, everybody wanted me to read their book or take their course. And I was like, you know, I'm pretty smart. I just want someone to show me, like, just show me what to do. I can do this, right? Because I didn't know anything about financial services when I got involved in that. I did pretty well, right? So, um, so I did. So that's what I did. I found someone to show me. So that's where sort of the, the germination of this idea came from is, you know, sometimes you don't need a long-term coaching um, program or, you know, a course, courses are awesome, but sometimes I just want one answer to one question or right. a sounding board or something. And so um, over the years, you know, I've, I've been in and out of the channel many times, a AV, telecom, IT side, and I've just built up this incredible network of people. And people are always asking me, oh, can you connect me to Carl? Can you connect me to Amy Babinchak or Eric Simpson or whoever? And I think that's fantastic. And I want to be that, that, that conduit, but you know, Carl, as you know, as a consultant and, and, and traveling all over, all you have is what's in your head, right? And you, you can't have enough pick your brain sessions, you know, you don't have enough time. So it's like, how can I, even with, you know, the dynamics of a small fee, that way you feel that your time is valued. The other person understands the value of your time too. And then, you know, you can um, get that, that critical answer to the question. So that's really where the idea kind of started. Um, you mentioned the coaching cafe and that was something where, you know, it, I was like, if we could take this in the platform and, and 
bring it into an experiential, you know, bring it experiential way into a live um, in person setting. That would be really cool. And so we, so that's what we did. We stood it up at uh, a channel partners and we just uh, did our very first virtual one too. So it's been, it's been an interesting ride. Very good. So take a second and tell us the website and how folks can connect with you on social media. Sure. So it's channelwise.com. And, uh, you know, if you're a vendor, we have uh, information for you on there. If you're a partner, there's information for you on there as well. All of our handles are get channelwise um, is the, is the, uh, is the handle, but you're obviously welcome to connect with me personally on LinkedIn as well. So I have to say, I love the idea of the bite size coaching or, or bite size advice, because there's a lot of things where like, I kind of sort of mostly know the big picture. I don't know how to get started or I don't know the next step or I don't know the first step or, you know, in, in some ways you go, you know, you talked about Google. Uh, in Google, if you don't know the one word that unlocks the key to everything, you will spend hours looking for something and then you find that one word and it's like, oh, right? Yeah. Suddenly, uh, you once you know the terminology, right? And it, it's the same way with many things in, in life that basically, uh, you, you just need a tiny bit of knowledge to unlock something, assuming you've already got a good base of, you know, owning a business, knowing things, right? I know things. Yeah. <laughs> so, Some um, things, yeah. Uh, so when, uh, when people engage in this, let me, let's take it first from what you call the vendor side. So if somebody is selling coaches, is that a vendor to you? So no, the vendor side is where, where vendors can actually engage with us and, and they can buy access to our experts for their partners. Because so many partners, you know, you they, they get into PRMs and there's all this content and there's all this and there's all this incredible things that uh, vendors and suppliers want to their partners to use to market, right? To to market their their goods and services. But if you, you, you can provide the greatest email campaign that has ever, you know, ever been designed, but if that partner doesn't really understand how to build the list, or maybe they don't know, um, you know, how to set up a, a, a lead funnel that will take them from the top, you know, through to the, those sales phases, or in my case, a lot of folks will book time with me just to walk through their sales deck, you so, know, and Hey, so you know, really, that kind of stuff. I was thinking it was a two part, but it's really a three part. There's vendors who might want to buy time so that coaches and uh, uh, I guess the clients can connect, connect to each other, right? So an, an MSP might want to coach with me and a vendor might want to make that happen. Correct. So any anybody MSPs vendors can come and get you know direct access to our to our uh, experts, or if a vendor wants to offer it to their partners as a as a benefit um, for being partnered with them, they can do that as well. So you know, and we and we obviously um, work with folks on many different levels. And this coaching cafe idea has kind of taken on a life of its own. You know, as an as an entrepreneur, you sort of have to pivot and go where things go. And we've been asked to bring this coaching cafe to many other events now. So it's been really, really interesting to see like the evolution of, um, you know, of, of the, of the product, of the service of our company, you know, even over the last few months that we just launched. So, yeah. So, so vendors and coaches and it consultants should all get in touch with you and figure out how they can play their role. For sure. Yeah. Very good. Now, when I did the coaching cafe in lost wages, um, <laughs> there were a lot of coaches and I know yeah. three of them uh, were with the National Society, but um, there were a lot of people in the room. So about how many coaches do you have signed up? So we have over 200 on the on the platform itself, and we have a, actually have a waiting list. Because you know, with any with any um, marketplace, it's that you know that supply and demand and things like that. So you know, we're we're slowly introducing um, you know more and more coaches and experts as the demand you know comes forth. But uh, in that case, we had 36 coaches that were live on site, um, and we'll be going to other events as well as I mentioned and. You know, it, it, you know, as an entrepreneur, you you think you have this great idea. You don't know. I didn't sleep. I think I told you I was like, I didn't sleep for like you know, 
like weeks before. And, um, you know, but we opened the door at 830 in the morning and there was already a line. And it, and as you know, like it just buzzed all day long. People were in and in and in. And we had walk-ins. We had, you know, people could, it's very highly curated. It's not like a situation in one of those apps where it's like, oh, try to schedule a meeting with Carl. And Carl's like, I don't know who you are. I'm not going to meet you. Um, <laughs> It's very, you know, it's highly curated and people book specific times. So, you know, it's it's been a, um, a really interesting journey, as I mentioned, but also just seeing that energy and the people walking away from a session with someone like you, Carl, was like, that was that was the best, you know, time that I spent at this conference because I got that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, time with someone to give me that practical advice I needed. And, and again, sometimes it's not a long drawn out thing. It's, it's I just got you unstuck. Well, and I may have uh, made myself too available at that event because I, uh, I had a lot of walk-ons, as did Eric Simpson and Amy Babinchek. And so I, I know that a lot of people just came in and and they weren't necessarily looking for me. They were looking for, for example, one person like, I'm trying to figure out the problem to this or the solution to this networking problem. Um, networking meaning meeting people and getting you know new clients engaged. Uh, and they sent them to me, right? So um and there's there's a bit of, of matchmaking as well that goes yeah. on. So when you say it's yeah. curated, it's sort of like that's the matchmaker role. So um, what kinds of other advice is available? Like marketing, obviously, but what else? Marketing, sales, M and A, because obviously that's a big thing in the channel now. Um, you know. Uh, things like how to, you know, how to build a channel program. So many new folks are coming in to the channel and wanting just, just to get an understanding of what it is and how can I build a world-class channel program? Some folks, legacy vendors who have these legacy channel programs, like how can I get more from my partner? So we have, you know, so we have that as well, but um, we have PR in there. There's legal advice in there. So um, how to hire, like hiring advice. Um, so really it runs, it runs the gamut. Uh, for for small businesses essentially and vendors, um, but then we add that nuance of the channel. So when you speak to um, someone about marketing, like SEO is SEO, right? Like you know the keywords are the keywords. But some of the folks you'll speak to, even when you speak about sales and marketing, they'll know what an MSP is. <laughs> right. They'll know what you know what the uh, um, the technology uh, oftentimes is. So it just helps to have that understanding of the of the world that we live in when you're trying to get that advice. And um, obviously, 20 minutes is not enough to get some of these topics covered. If you only have a nugget of a need. Then a nugget of, of knowledge is perfect. But what if you have a bigger need, like the legal? I can't imagine that 20 minutes of legal is going to do me a lot of good. It might point me in the right direction, but then what do I do from there? So the so the actual experiential, the coaching cafes are 25 minute time slots, but on the actual platform, they're 50 minutes. So they're basically double double the amount of time. Um, and and even in that time, sometimes it's not enough. But the way we work is the all of our experts. You you can't pay to be an expert. You can't apply to be an expert. You have to be invited because we want to make sure that it's a, a it's an exclusive experience. We want the best of the best. And so. What we say to our experts is at the end of that call, if that individual wants to continue to do business with you, go forth and conquer. We don't ask for referral fees. I don't want to be chasing down people for, for, for money and sticking my hands in their pockets. You know, everyone that's on there is part of this community that wants to give back. And sure, we make money from the calls that you that you all do and the vendors that come in. But at the end of the day, if 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 someone wants to engage with you and your community, um, buy one of your courses or whatever, we want that to be, um, you know, as part of the process. So I always said before ecosystem became a thing, I would say, you know, I'm trying to support the whole ecosystem. So the MSPs, vendors, whoever who need the um, the coaching, the the folks who actually do the coaching, and even taking it as you said a step further with the vendors who can then give their partners something new and different that would um, differentiate their partner program from another that can help their partners do more business. So really, it it, it like lifts everyone up. So you may or may not have seen it, but uh, a while back I did a fairly lengthy article in my newsletter about coaching is probably not right for most MSPs, you know, to, to sign up for four calls a month, $5,000, you know, uh, for six months or a, a year, um, especially if they have one employee and they can only change one thing at a time, it is a total waste of money. <laughs> so, but 
that same person could certainly use an hour's worth of very focused attention. So, uh, you know, the, the alternatives to coaching, peer groups and so forth and so on are spectacular. And so this sounds like a great little addition to that mixture of things that are actually useful to MSPs. Well, yeah, because you can take that information you learn in a peer group, you sit around and folks will say, oh, I've done this, I've done that. And then you can come away with it. And I, I use my own expert network all the time, Carl, like <laughs> I'll set time with someone, you know, we were redoing our marketing, our, our one of our marketing funnels. And I set a time with one of our copywriting experts. And I was like, tell me what I'm not doing right here, because something's not flowing right. Or I just want someone to look at it. So so you're absolutely right. It's like, it's not a, an ongoing thing. And I, and I think for a lot of small businesses, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say coaching is useless necessarily, but I think that um, when you are, when you are small, sometimes you just need that, that um, either validation or um, that, you know, the pointing in the right direction. And then you can just take that next step. Yeah. I'm not saying it's completely useless, but if you're only one person spending that kind of money uh, and not being able to implement anything, so we're going to send folks to channelwise.com and also uh, check out Get Channelwise on miscellaneous social media. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Carl. Hey, uh, so have you heard anything new about the famous cage match that's supposed to happen here with uh, our two uh, big leaders in the industry, Elon Musk and Zuckerberg? You know, neither one of them are my favorite people to really follow. So, um, <laughs> so I haven't, uh, I haven't heard much of an update. I heard, I can't even tell you where I heard something somewhere that Elon was trying to find a way to get out, but I don't know if that's true. I mean, that, who knows, that could have been a, a poke that Zuckerberg and, and him, I know, like to poke at each other. So that could have been yeah. Zuckerberg poking at Elon, like, oh, you're looking for a way out, you know, <laughs> who knows? Yeah. I had, it, it just seems like it's a, a bunch of hype and nothing will happen. But I did just read that Zuckerberg said he was responding to a question about, hey, is this really going to happen or what's the latest going on? And he said, hey, if you hear any report in the media from Elon, uh, it's false because it didn't come through me and and he just is spouting his mouth off. But if it comes through me, then it's valid and truthful because I give him the courtesy of making sure we're on the same sheet of music. So uh, <laughs> I, could, I couldn't tell if that was just more hype or if that was uh, truth indeed. <laughs> oh, who knows? I, I'm not really sure that I care. You know, the only thing I really, the only thing I really, would like there's one thing i would like to come from this stupid cage match and mm -hmm. that is to have it held up as a the worst and most visible uh confirmation that our industry has a serious bro culture problem yeah there is no better example than two industry leaders having saying that they're going to do a, a cage match um it's 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 ridiculous and it we still have a problem with there not being enough women in our industry and the sad part is it's not that they don't go to school and get their degrees it's not that they don't start their careers in this industry it's that they drop out and so by the time you reach the the middle of a career they're not in the industry anymore so they're leaving for a reason and um you know we have to acknowledge it and we have to try to we have to try to do something to fix it. It shouldn't be scaring any particular group out of a career path. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna get no argument from me. I agree. It's it's almost embarrassing uh to to see that because I I was more of a Elon Musk fan uh initially than uh, Zuckerberg, but uh just be from his innovation, his mind. Uh, in, in what he's doing with electricity primarily. But uh, anyway, I'm very disinterested anymore. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> leave it at that. So, um, and then you had mentioned something just as we were chatting earlier about a, a funny post that you had saw online. What was the context of that? Oh my gosh, it was a, a new security vendor was made a post into a, an MSP group as they do. And um, you know, and they said, oh, yeah, we're, 
we're an amazing new security vendor and our product will add revenue to your business. And the <laughs> and, and that at that in itself was like, okay, yeah, you know, we've we've heard that story before. Um, you know, it's just kind of a not very interesting post, right? Didn't actually tell us anything about their product. Um, but the comment in the post was hilarious because the the comment right under it was a gif of a guy repeatedly yawning. Like, and, and, and in there, in there, he, you know, he, the guy that posted it wrote, oh, look, another vendor telling us, telling us that buying their product will, will make us money. Um, and it's uh, not necessarily not true. It's just not a very interesting way to tell, you know, that's not going to get me to buy your product, right? I still know nothing about product. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's interesting. Uh, I, I laughed when you told me that initially, and I, I'm still laughing in my mind, but it, it kind of makes me think in our industry specifically, there are a lot of, I'll just say vendors in general, consultants, vendors that are almost more of that snake oil salesman mentality where they, they have these huge, like, oh, we can quadruple your MRR in 90 days. And it's like, what? <laughs> and I'm still shocked at how many people just, you know, I call it clickbait. You know, they just click on it and believe it. And um, I don't know. I, I think I already know your opinion of that. But what what are your thoughts? I'm sure you've seen those types of marketing claims. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's ridiculous. Although, you know, I'm sure that they can hold up an MSP that that happened to. Right. Mm -hmm. But all of their customers are not going to have those results, right? It's like the latest, greatest yeah. diet, right? The latest diet fad. They can, they can get a couple of people for their commercials, but um, you know, most people are going to have the same results on any diet they choose. <laughs> I yeah. think it's the I think it's the same thing, no, right? It you can make money with anybody's product, but um, you know that would have to be the entire focus of your business, right? Um, so I'm just really disappointed overall in how security companies in particular are marketing themselves. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of these revenue claims we're see, but most often I see the easy button claim, right? Um, yeah. it, just, just click here and everything will be secure. We're going to take care of all of it for you. And um, how do I know that's true? Right. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, that's a lot of trust to put into somebody. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, as you and I were talking earlier, you, these are brand new companies, so they don't have a track, track record to necessarily mm -hmm. support that claim either. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an important point to really vet out your strategic or go-to-market partners. You know, if you're, if you're adding, you know, two, three, four new security vendors in your security stack, you need to vet them out and uh, make sure, you know, go visit them if you can. You know, I, I, uh, I remember when I was running my practice, Amy, I did that on purpose. And one, I was trying to vet them out. Two, I was trying to form a really tight bond with their executive leadership. Uh, so I would get favoritism, like leads and free stuff, hint, hint. But but more importantly, I was trying to, uh, you know, form, you know, trusted relationships with the salespeople and, you know, go break bread. And uh, But you, you really, when you can make the type of effort, go visit them. I think it makes all the difference in the world. I was down... Uh, earlier this year to the new threat locker headquarters down in Orlando, Florida. And it was the, um, um, I think it was the old EA arts uh, software programming, you know, where they ran that business. It's a super impressive eight story building. It was huge. And, you know, they basically had the entire building. Wow. Uh, and they, you know, they're growing like crazy, but it was the real deal. They keep everything in house and got a behind the scenes tour of, of what's really going on there. But, you know, that's a perfect example of that's the real deal. Um, and then I think they were, I was there for a two day workshop conference. One of our mastermind events were there in that 
it was a Thursday, Friday, that Thursday night, there was like a big ransomware attack. So a bunch of their team were there overnight. So the next morning, Friday, when we came in, we did a tour and we got to talk to some of the people that were dealing with that uh, right, right then and there. So it was kind of, uh, that was an extra bonus. But um, anyway, vet, vet out your partners and, and make sure they're the real deal if you can. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> I've done, uh, I've done similar things. Um, you know, uh, Calyptix was our firewall of choice. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've been down to visit them in the Carolinas and spent day with their team. And, you know, it was really interesting, you know, that they talk about what their priorities are and they want to know what your priorities are and how they're aligning. And, you know, their vendors are, good vendors are craving information that you have right they want to do a good job for their partners yeah. and they have a lack of opportunity to, to talk to us just as we have a lack of opportunity to talk to many of them so if you can bridge that gap for them many of them will will jump on it um so also when i was in california one time equus was our our computer builder partner of choice and they were um down there in in orange county and i was out for for uh, SMB Tech Fest one time. So I went over there and visited them and they had a super impressive facility. And like you said, I got to know some of their executive team and um, see some of the other work they did besides supplying computers to us. They also, you know, showed off some of their things, work they were doing for Netflix and, you know, enterprise level things. And it was just really, you always learn something when you, you go and do that yeah. too. And, yeah. Come come away with a relationship and also a confidence that you've selected the right partner for you. Yeah. You know, people do business with people and, and it's, you know, regardless of how busy you are, you know, Amy, you just said the key word relationship. You know, it's so much easier to build relationships when I think when you get face to face uh, and, and you're deliberate and you carve out time and you go meet with them. I think that's super important for your strategic partners. So Awesome, awesome. Okay. Well, any anything else going on that you wanted to to share um, here? The I guess the rest of the month or early next month. You up to anything else? Well, the thing I have to do is, you know, I have a presentation on Azure Active Directory and getting your secure score up to a hundred percent. I'm going to be giving that presentation in Georgia in September at the. Um, Practical 365 conference, which is put on by Quest. Uh, however, I have to go through and update that because Microsoft changed their calculations for secure score, but most importantly, they renamed the product to Entra ID. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I really have some some updating to do to get ready for that that presentation next month. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm a little behind. One of the the things I've been working on coming, I wanted to come into the fall, and uh, again, I'm a little behind. I've, I've got a couple book projects that I'm working on. One a professional, uh, one on security, and then one on uh, you know uh, professional selling, consultative selling, the the simplified sales process. Uh, I think we've overcomplicated the sales process in our our industry. And, and subsequently confused a lot of clients and lost a lot of deals. So um, anyway, nice. I've, been, I've been working on the outline of, of that book. I'm excited to get that done. It should be done by the end of the year. Nice. Well, you know, I'm 100% on board with that idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think um, I think that is a wrap on our side. Um, any final words of wisdom? Oh, enjoy the rest of the summer while it's here. Get out there and enjoy the weather because fall is coming. I think it's going to be early. There's my prediction. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people in the Midwest with that that heat wave going through, I think, uh, would welcome fall. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and the summer is going by so quickly. So get out there and enjoy it. And uh, anyway, good to connect with you this week, Amy. We'll uh, see you next week, okay? See you then. All right, adios.